first of all, I would like to uh, thank Michelle for the uh, excellent presentation. Uh, this could be the shortest presentation in, in storage history. I could just say I second that and uh, take <laughs> off. Maybe I should bring a bit of the uh, entertainment that I, was, that I was planning to bring. Uh, and, and by the way, Ampedata perfectly solved the, uh, the second problem that you were uh, referring to, the triple numbers uh, that we can share with you uh, are uh, awesome. Uh, unfortunately, I don't have them uh, prepared on slide. Um, a lot of smart people here, I'm not going to try to be smarter, so I'm going to take it easy. It's Sunday morning, uh, bring you a use case, uh, which will probably be uh, much appreciated on a Sunday morning. Uh, I want to present to you how uh, Amplidata helped um, a very large uh, festival uh, build a live archive uh, based on uh, object storage uh, for, for the rich uh, video archive. Uh, who of you have heard of uh, the Montreux uh, Jazz Festival? Good. Thanks. So uh, Montreux Jazz has been uh, around for uh, 45 years and uh, they have contacted us because they had a storage problem which we helped uh, them to solve. Uh, the partners who were involved in this project were of course Montreux Jazz the festival uh, itself. They have a separate company called Montreux Sounds uh, which does um, all the stuff in the back end for them. Um, then EPFL is a university in Switzerland who they work together with. They get a, a lot of help from students and they can keep it all cheap through that um, because festivals, they may look like people who are making a lot of money, but it's not always like that. Um, EPFL has a Metamedia uh, Center, uh, which is uh, specialized in everything related to uh, sound and video. And then uh, obviously there's also uh, Amplidata. Uh, Montreux, uh, just very quickly, it's one of the most famous uh, music festivals in the world. Uh, it was instigated in uh, 76 by uh, a man called Claude Knobs. Uh, the guys from EPFL, and actually I would have wanted them to present this uh, presentation, but they couldn't make it. Uh, they will uh, refer to Claude as a bit of a geek. Um, he's been recording, uh, oops, uh, what's happening? All right. He's been recording his uh, the concerts at his festival uh, since since day one. He's been experimenting with uh, HD video for about 20 years now, so uh, he's pretty geeky. Uh, initially, the, the festival was very jazz focused, but uh, later uh, more rock and other jo uh, genres were uh, added to that, uh, including Frank Zappa, uh, Deep Purple, uh, Led Zeppelin, uh, and quite recently uh, Prince as well. Uh, to show you how legendary the festival was, uh, is, sorry, uh, this is a fragment of the, the lyrics of uh, Deep Purple's uh, Smoke on the Water. Uh, and actually, Claude Knobs is mentioned in there. What they talk about is a fire that happened in the casino there, and how Claude was uh, saving people. He actually saved uh, four people's lives uh, at, at the festival. Uh, Deep Purple is always happy to go back to that festival, and they've got a, a great um, DVD of a recent performance. Uh, the project, so uh, the festival has been around for 45 years. Uh, over that time, they have um, acquired about 5,000 hours of video, but also 5,000 hours of very uh, high quality audio. Um, they've got about 3,000 concert descriptions. Some of those descriptions were done with pen and paper. So there was a, a lot of work, a lot of uh, student work uh, to digitize all of that. There is uh, probably millions of photos and, and thousands of press releases. And all of that was stored in Mr. Claude Knopf's villa, just in his uh, attic, or, or I don't, he probably had a special room for that. Mostly still just the original recordings. Can you imagine the, those like 30-year-old tapes lying there in, in, uh, in his villa? <coughs> Not the smartest idea. And indeed, a couple of years ago, uh, Claude was starting to, to see that uh, videos were going bad, tapes were getting corrupt. Uh, so he had a problem. Um, so Claude had the ID, well, the bright ID. I, I've got to save those recordings. And he started investigating with EPFL how they could make uh, an archive, uh, a secure archive of uh, all that information. So they wanted to digitize those projects. And he wanted also, uh, he wanted the archive to be available for, for cultural and scientific projects. So it had to be a live archive. And uh, obviously, uh, since Claude is a bit of a geek, he's now, uh, well, he's been doing uh, 3D recordings uh, for one or two years now. And I think this year they're going to do, do 2 or 4K uh, even. 
So the archive is going to have to scale, uh, also very important. Um, so after a couple of discussions, they decided they actually wanted two ar uh, archives. In the first place, they built a, a static archive, uh, tape-based, uh, just to, to be sure that the, uh, the data could be protected off-site, uh, that everything was very secure, and, and that those old tapes were, were uh, no longer uh, threatened uh, to, to, uh, to decay. Uh, and then in the second place, uh, they wanted to add an active, a disk-based archive to that, uh, uh, which had to be online with a file system-like access. Um, the, the system had to support very large files, over terabyte uh, file support, uh, and they needed very high uh, throughput uh, numbers uh, to be able to stream, and, and, and that part of the project I'm going to talk about uh, in a bit. So uh, the requirement for the disk archive was that uh, the system had to be uh, low power, uh, TCO had to be low, uh, as I mentioned, those festivals don't have huge budgets. Um, so the, uh, the TCO, the, the, the power of the TCO issue ruled out traditional uh, rate systems. Um, and at the time, I'm talking two, three years back now, they just couldn't find any solution that could help them. So the, uh, the active archive was put on a hold until they met the after data. So uh, after data enabled uh, EPFL to build this uh, long-term uh, archive um, with very low energy uh, requirements uh, and, and uh, an availability policy that uh, EPFL and uh, Monterey Jazz could uh, pick themselves. So, uh, it's a uh, policy-based uh, availability. Um, the system, of course, had to be low latency, otherwise they could just as well uh, stick to tape. Um, and, and what I also liked very much is that uh, Ampli-Data um, enables uh, EPFL and Monterey Jazz to eventually become hardware independent. Right now, the, the uh, Ampli Store solution, because that's the solution that we're uh, using for this, uh, it's shipped pre-installed on hardware, but uh, eventually they will uh, be able to, to uh, put in new hardware and, and uh, really become uh, independent of the hardware that we deliver, uh, which is very important uh, to, to provide a uh, long uh, life cycle. Uh, security obviously was still important. Um, there, there was a lot of um, uh, conflicts uh, negotiated with the, the artists and it would be a problem if, if some of those uh, concerts uh, leaked uh, and, and people could put their hands on it and uh, were not allowed uh, to, to, to get hold of that uh, thing to piracy here. Uh, and open access was also very important. They wanted to be able uh, in, in the university to develop applications that would talk to the storage uh, directly, uh, so uh, REST web that were uh, important protocols there. Uh, so very quickly, the architecture, uh, EPFL ordered an initial uh, 128 uh, storage nodes, which is good for uh, over uh, one petabyte, actually it's 1.2 petabytes. Uh, this is what the architecture looks like. They also put in three controllers to, to, to provide a sufficient uh, throughput and a number of switches. This is what the system looks like. Uh, that's a basic system. Uh, so we, we see there are three controller nodes. Uh, and you can, you can read the specs for yourself and uh, eight uh, initial uh, storage uh, nodes. What are the next steps? Um, right now, um, the, the, the files are being transferred from uh, the, the static archive to the live archive. Uh, over time, uh, the archive uh, will grow, uh, will grow as, as, as uh, more um, videos are recorded. Uh, they're also going to use the system in their products. Uh, a duplicate system is going to create it uh, at the Montreal uh, organization and they're going to use that for uh, more DVD production uh, to create the TV foot, uh, footage. Uh, and also, and, and that's a very interesting one, um, to, to stream it to the Montreal Jazz uh, Cafe. So as I said, Claude is a very visionary guy. He's now building uh, Montreal Jazz Cafes. See it as um, the, the uh, hardware cafes, but a smaller version and a bit more cozy, and there's not going to be that many around. Uh, at, at the moment, they're aiming at about 10 worldwide. Um, New York, Geneva, Tokyo is, is what they're building right now. And in those uh, Monterey Jazz cafes, people are going to be able to have a drink, eat something, and, uh, and at the meantime, uh, enjoy uh, the live concerts of 45 years uh, Monterey Jazz, for which uh, they, they needed that uh, active archive. And that was it.
Thank you.